the question is, are we a Christian nation? I don't know if these stats are exactly right, but let's just assume they're close to being right. Uh, 65% of Americans say they identify as Christian. Now again, I don't know if that's spot on, but let's just assume that it's pretty close tonight. Now, how many of you would agree that Roman Catholics um, are, are not born-again Christians? Okay, I got saved out of Roman Catholicism. So, when Roman Catholics are built into that bunch of 65%, and 25% of that 65% are Roman Catholics who believe in grace and works, who believe Mary is a mediator, that's not biblical salvation. So if they identify, and they are, they put them as part of the 65% of Christians, what does that bring our percentage down to? We're down to 40% of Americans who are truly Christians. Right, so would we need to witness to them and give them the gospel? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So that brings us down to now only 40% of Americans identifying as Christians. So if we just looked at, if it tips 50%, we can say, wow, we're a Christian nation. Well, we just went the other way. Now we're 40%. How many of you would agree that Mormons who don't believe the Bible, I mean, they believe the Bible so corrupted you can't believe it, they hate the Trinity. They don't believe God, Jesus, the deity of Jesus Christ. Um, if you met a Mormon, would you have to witness to them? So they, Okay, well, 2% of that, 65% are Mormon. So now we're down to 38% of Americans are truly Christians. The Jehovah's Witness, it's a works-based salvation. They do not believe Jesus is God. They absolutely reject the Trinity. 1% of that group out of the 65 is Jehovah's Witnesses. They will say that they are Christians. That brings us down to 37% of Americans as Christian. Uh, We spoke to a Seventh-day Adventist last night. You get a gospel tract that tells you hell isn't literal. And then when you go down that rabbit trail, you find out that us gathering on Sunday, we took the mark of the beast. We should be keeping the Sabbath. And um, they do not believe that Jesus is the scapegoat. Those two goats and that blood offering, we talked about that last week. They believe Satan's the scapegoat. I mean, it's wicked. It's grace plus works plus a bunch of weird stuff. Well, half a percent of that, one half percent of that 65% that we started with are Seventh-day Adventists. And we need to witness to those people. We need to love those people. But that brings us down to 36.5% of Americans as Christian. That'd be pretty low. (laughs) That'd be pretty low. Now, I said all that to say this, to ask this. How many of you heard of the new apostolic reformation? How many of you heard that term? It's it's been shortened as NAR, N-A-R, acronym for new apostolic reformation. Okay. Almost 10% of that 65%. Now again, I'm trusting these stats are are close to being real. And if we assume that they are, 10% of the 65 that we started with are part of this new apostolic reformation. And the new apostolic reformation, it's all about experience, and it's never about what's plainly and clearly stated in the Bible. So the Bible isn't the authority, their experience is the authority. I'm going to give you some of their core beliefs. I know this is dry. We're going to open up the Bible in a minute. But I want you to get a hold of this thought because we're going somewhere with it. The New Apostolic Reformation, it's not a denomination. They don't call themselves a denomination. So there's not like a website directory you could go to and say, oh, here's a NAR church. You know, we can go there. That's not the way this works. And one of their, their, their their key ideology is We're just going to use the Bible as a prop. (laughs) That's all the Bible is to them. It's It's a prop. Their favorite weapon is, let's see what we can take out of context today. Where's the lie? Yeah. Where's the lie? That's exactly right. 
Okay, so some, some beliefs here. The three main tenets you will hear from somebody who's part of the New Apostolic Reformation is spiritual warfare, political control, and power of their apostles. That's three main tenets of their beliefs. Number two, because man lost dominion at the fall, they also believe in this other doctrine that's wrapped up in it that we won't do a deep dive into tonight which is called the seven mountain mandate. Because man lost dominion at the fall, now they believe, according to this seven mountain mandate, that we need to take power and control over these seven spheres or these seven mountains. Religion, family, education, media, arts, finances, and lastly, government, which they believe is the most important. And so the new apostolic reformation is chock full of political ideologies. And it's why they push control over politics. And this goes way beyond me telling you or you telling me to go down and vote in your local election and make sure you vote your conscience based on being a Christian. It goes way, way beyond that. They believe in, the New Apostolic believes in, a political theocracy. And that's a form of government where priests rule in the name of God. Have you read the Constitution? Does it say we the church? <laughs> it says we the people, right? So it's the majority of the people that this country has been founded on where the people get to decide what rules. It's not the church, though. It's we the people. And you know why we don't believe in a theocracy? Because we aren't national Israel. We're not national Israel. So there was a political theocracy from Moses all the way up until Saul when the people didn't want to have a theocracy. Just give me a God, like, give me a king like all the other nations. And there comes Saul. We don't live in that time. So we don't, have a, we don't have a political theocracy. So God gave him a human king. Um, and we are going to be, once we finish up our Sunday school lessons, we're doing our identity as a local church. When we finish that up, we are going to go through what dispensations look like biblically. And uh, this thought will come back into that. And I think we'll get a better understanding of how, from the beginning of time, how God meted out or dispersed truth. Go to Psalm 72. Might as well get in the Bible. Uh, might as well get in the Bible. I think you got enough stats. Psalm 72. How many of you believe in a 1,000 year millennial reign of Jesus Christ? Okay. We are, uh, we are big believers in premillennialism. And we are big believers that Christ is going to come back at His second advent. And at that time, He is going to set up a theocracy. He is going to set it up, and He's going to rule and reign on the earth for 1,000 years. I asked you to turn to Psalm 72 because in context, this is a millennial kingdom chapter. And I'd like us to read about half of it. Um, we might as well... Let's read it together. Why don't we do that? We'll read it together, starting at verse 1. We'll read all the way down to verse 11. Okay, ready? Give the king thy judgments, O Lord, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgments. The mountains shall bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people, he shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish an abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. 
They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and, she and, and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. This is talking about the king and Rishit's judgment. And, and, and all of that is the theocracy of when the king returns. But right now, we are not in a theocracy. We are in his body, the church. Is Jesus Christ king? Amen. He is. Is he the king of the church or is he the head of the church? He's the head of the church. He is going to be the king when he comes back and he rules. The first time he came as a suffering servant, the second time he's going to come as a righteous ruling king and it will be a theocracy. Right now, his people have been placed into a body where which he is our head. He is our head. We are part of his body. And when we say we, we the people, I mean me. I'm part of his body too. I'm just the guy that talks. Okay? But I'm not the head. Well, praise God for that. Amen. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, it, it, if you were up there and you were the head, the thing would go south. If you were up there and you were the head, the thing would go south. If you were up there and you were the head, the thing would go south. I will call me reverend. I like so he has to call me reverend. Ask his wife if he calls his wife calls him reverend. Come on, buddy. Christ is the head. And yes, he is king of kings and lord of lords. Except he's not coming back to be king yet. He wants to be the head of the church. He is the head of the church. Just allow him to have the authority that he says he wants over his church. He purchased it with his blood. So, that's that. Okay, we'll go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse number 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, Revelation 21, 3. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. That's a future look. That's a future look. But God is not ruling over the earth now. During the millennial reign, he will be ruling over the earth. Who is ruling over the earth now? Who did God relinquish that control to? Satan. He is the prince of the power of the air. He has temporary control that was relinquished to him for a season, for a time. God's going to come back, defeat all that, and he is going to be the righteous ruler on the earth. Where does He rule now? In our hearts. Does the peace of God dwell and rule in your heart? Okay, we've been placed into a body, so we're protected, we're part of His church, and we want others, individuals, to come to that saving knowledge of truth. We aren't here to set up a theocracy. We're here to help people have the peace of God rule in their heart. That's the ruling that they should receive. The third thing that the New Apostolic Reformation believes that's, that's just, it's just damnable, it's wrong. There's a false doctrine that they call manifest sons of God. And this is that the church is the incarnation of God and should, it's the church's responsibility to take dominion over the earth before Christ returns. So, this new apostolic reformation sees themselves as a new breed of Christians that are arising and they will have supernatural spiritual powers 
and they are going to subdue the earth. How many of you have heard the term being said by conservatives, Joel's army? Have you ever heard that in speeches? Start listening for that. That's this. That's this. You hear Joel's army. That's a tip-off of the manifest sons of God. They believe that they're God's special elite forces and that they're the ones that are going to destroy God's enemies and take over political power and control of the earth. They have absolutely no understanding of God's physical blessings that He promised Israel as opposed to the spiritual blessings that He gave to His church. So when you hear Joel's army or soldiers that are rising up during the last days to take dominion before Christ's return, start listening for those terms. That's a tip-off. This is NAR stuff. This is New Apostolic stuff. Have you heard the name William Branham or Rick Joyner? You hear those names, run. A church or a book or an author or a ministry is associated with those names, run. It's New Apostolic stuff. They believe it's their job to purge the world of sin. Go to John 5. Because God doesn't instruct any of us to execute judgment on any unbeliever. Send me and Eric out, you know, and, and Trampus. Get us all, you know, knocking on doors. We're here to execute judgment on any unbeliever. You're going to believe the way we believe. We're going to, you know, we'll go around town like we're some spiritual Rambos, you know. That's what this thing is. It's not Christian. We are not, that's not what we're called to do. We'll take Dominic too, you know. He's, we just get everybody involved and we'll get everybody living right. No, we won't. No, we won't. No, we won't. John 5. John 5. John 5. Uh, let's start at verse 25. Verily, verily, I send you, the hour is come, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they, shall, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in Himself, so hath He given to the Son to have life in Himself, and hath given Him, who would that be? Jesus, authority to execute judgment also, because He is the Son of Man. Who has the authority to judge? God. God. This doesn't have anything to do with our ability and God's expectation for us to discern things through judgment. This is about God ultimately is the one who will execute judgment. We can't forget that. It's not our place. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Because the second false, the other false thing they believe is that Jesus was sent as a pattern for the church, but Jesus isn't complete without us. This is New Apostolic Reformation teaching. Because He is the head and we are the body, Jesus isn't complete unless He has us. So they believe and conclude that the church now somehow becomes Christ. It's false doctrine. What does Colossians 2, verse 10 say? Let's read it together. Colossians 2, verse 10. And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, and upholding all things by the word of His power. He is the head. You and I have find full completeness in Him. This idea that Jesus was sent as a pattern for the church, and He's just incomplete unless He has us, it's absolute blasphemy. The most disturbing thing about the New Apostolic Reformation that you must know is that they believe that God has restored apostles as the true leaders over pastors and teachers. So they would look at a church like ours and every other Christian church that has pastors and teachers and evangelists and they would say, well, they really don't have any spiritual power. We're going to have to send over Apostle 
Catherine. <laughs> oh, don't laugh. There's an apostle Catherine. She's a devil. She's a devil. And she's got a big following. And she goes to towns and she delivers people. She is a wicked devil. And the New Apostolic Reformation is all about that. They're embracing this. They believe that without apostles, the church has no power, which makes it impossible. If the church has no power, then it makes it impossible for the church to fulfill its Great Commission. And the Great Commission isn't preaching or spreading the gospel. The Great Commission is political takeover. This is an absolute serious thing in our country, when we look at statistics of Christians, 10% of the 65 make up this. And they believe that they have special power from God. Now, how do you guess? Give me some answers. How would you guess that you would grow as a Christian and you would mature as a Christian in this movement? Throw me some answers. All that you learned so far, how would you guess that you can grow and mature as a Christian? Give me some answers. Throw some out. Well, first of all, maybe getting into this a little bit more. Yeah, if you were a true Christian. But in that new apostolic reformation, how would you grow? Applying for a local office. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there, there you go. Leave <laughs> the ladies, ladies group. Okay, right? Okay. The big way, the big way that you grow, submit to the apostle. Submit to the apostle. Because if you submit to the apostle who has the spiritual power and the spiritual authority to do deliverance, now your submission to that great apostle of God will now allow you to experience the miracles and allow you to experience the deliverance from all of the demons and allow you to be able to be part of the, the, the control and the political takeover. It's all wrapped up in a hodgepodge of mess. Who are we supposed to submit to? All of us. All of us. It's bad news. It's bad news. They believe and they teach their folks that as you learn to submit to them, now those apostles can now do more of the mass healings and all those deliverance stuff that you see. Just give us money first. And that was next on my notes. And you need to send them large amounts of money. You know why? Because we do need to establish God's kingdom on the earth, and so we're going to need your money to help. Yep. And it's a salvation that provides, it's a false salvation that provides people a huge emotional payout. And people are led by their emotions. And hey, if you can get a new spiritual gift, and if you can experience a new miraculous healing, And people buy into that stuff. 10% of the 65% of Americans who claim Christianity are now part of this new apostolic reformation. It is one of the fastest growing false religions in our nation right now. It's very, very dangerous. So when you start hearing things or talking to people or seeing news clips, I want these terms to be fresh in your, in your mind so you have at least a baseline. Why don't we have modern day apostles? Go to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9 and 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 1. Why don't we read that verse together, all of us? 1 Corinthians 9, 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? An apostle must have personally seen Jesus. 
Nobody can be an apostle now. He gave the gift, but nobody qualifies for the gift anymore. Do you believe in the gift of apostleship? Absolutely. Let's look at what the Bible requires, though, to be able to claim that gift. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Let's read verses 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians 15, 7 and 8. After that, he was seen of James and then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. An apostle must have seen the Christ. Go to Luke 6. Luke 6. Luke chapter 6, let's read verse 13 together. Luke 6, and let's read verse 13. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve apostles, whom also he named apostles. Jesus specifically designated them. In Luke 6, 13, he's the one that called, and he's the one that chose. Nobody today meets that qualification. Look at Matthew 10. Matthew 10, verse number 1. Let's read that verse together. Matthew 10, 1. Matthew 10, verse 1. Ready? And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Jesus is the one who gave it. It says He gave. You can't count on your hand how many false apostles there are. You know how many times those guys have failed? We're going to heal this. We're going to cure this. We're going to... Man, those, it's a false deal. And the new apostolic reformation is wrapped up in this deliverance stuff and this healing stuff. Stay far, far away from it. Go to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18, verse number 22. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 18, verse 22, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it. Presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. And you know how many of these apostles and prophets are speaking things and they don't come to pass? It's not what the Lord says. No reason to be afraid of them. They have no power at all. The Old Testament made that real clear. It's a satanic movement of mysticism, Christian witchcraft. They're just false apostles. Everything about the New Apostolic Reformation is false. It's a dangerous, dangerous group. And we have to stay away from it and preach against it. Um, the New Apostolic Reformation, they believe that if there's a problem in a city, it's because that city has a demonic spirit influence. They're big on demons, which aren't mentioned in the Bible, but devils are. We can do a lesson on that later. So they, need, they believe that they need to send in their prophets and their apostles to heal the area, to get rid of the demons. So when you go on YouTube, you can see this stuff of these false apostles. And uh, by the way, Paula White's part of this. Paula White's part of this, and uh, guess who she was the counsel to? Guess whose pastor she was? Our former presidents. We're going to get into our national leaders next week and see what the statistics of those are that are Christian. But when you hear Paula White, she says, I cancel every demon and, and, and all that stuff. It's new apostolic stuff. She says, let every demonic network be broken. And you know, she goes on her Pentecostal apostolic rant. They don't believe that pastors and teachers and evangelists have any power. The apostles have to come in. Bad, bad news, bad stuff. Okay, go to John 18 
And uh, we'll start to wind down here. But with all that said, with all that said, we started with 65% of Americans who claim to be Christian. We deduct this 10% of the New Apostolic Reformation that isn't Christian. We're down to 26.5% of Americans Christian. It's about a quarter of a percent. Sad. I'll take half of that. I'll take if half of those actually started living for Christ, we'd probably have revival. I, I mean, I would go with okay, twenty to twenty-five percent are saved, but I wouldn't. I would not bank on even half of them actually witnessing or living for Christ or doing family devotions or trying to go to church or doing anything that would be like just baseline Christianity. But I'll tell you, if we had all of them. Christian, all of those Christians actually living for God, we'd have revival. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm concerned for you young ones. I'm concerned. Because it's going to be really, really hard for you to find another Christian to marry. It's concerning. The Muslims are breeding, the Mormons are breeding. The atheists are breeding. And the Christians, it's like, yeah, it's no big deal. You know, whoever makes me feel good. And, and you know, it's like, you got to understand this is, this is a spiritual battle. You've got to be praying. Now. I mean, are you praying now for your children? Now? Don't wait till they're 20. Start praying now. Start teaching them the Bible now. Take what we learned in Sunday school. Use it as family devotions. Pray. Take the points and then expand it. Get in the Word and expand it and talk to your kids about these things. This is a battle, man. We need families. 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 Mama's reading their kids the Bible. Daddy's doing it. All of it. In John 18, verse 36... John 18, you all know the verse. Watch what it says in verse 36. Let's read it together. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. But now, not now, it will be. But He came the first time. Man, He didn't come to set up a kingdom. What they wanted Him to do when He came. Man, kingdom, Lord, kingdom, kingdom. Not now. Not now. My kingdom is not of this world. You know what he said? I'm not setting up a political kingdom. He's setting up a political kingdom at his millennial reign. Well, I want to identify as a Christian. He said, Oh, I want to identify as a Christian. Well, that's funny. You don't talk like a Christian. You don't act like a Christian. You don't go where Christians go. You don't pray like Christians. You don't fellowship like Christians. You don't love like Christians. You really don't do anything that a Christian does, but you want to identify as a Christian. Really? That's like you identifying as a cat. You can identify as a cat all you want. You're not a cat. You're not a kitty cat. Boy wants to identify as a girl. You can identify as a girl or you want. You ain't a girl, you're a boy. You're always going to be a boy. It's, it's ridiculous. I want to identify as a Christian. 65% of Americans. You can identify all you want, you're not a Christian. It's ridiculous. If you want to identify as <laughs> if you want to identify as a Christian, what do you think you should start doing? What do you think? Give me an answer. Milani, what do you think a Christian does? Um, uh, go out and minister, uh, minister to people uh, and teach them about the gospel. Right. I identify as a Christian. Well, that's funny. You haven't talked to anybody about Jesus your entire life, but you want to identify as a Christian. Are you going to believe them? No. What else do Christians do? Dominic? Their lives different from others. Right. Because they're bound by what Jesus said. Yeah. Because they love Jesus. And if you, if, you, if you say you're a Christian, but you don't have any of the characteristics, they're not Christian. They're putting it off on the pole or the whatever, you know? 
I want to identify a boy now. I want to identify as a girl. And a girl identifies a boy. You can, do, you can say that all you want. You're not. It's who are you for real? Not what you want to identify as. What are your true colors? And this new apostolic reformation, it ain't right. They're identifying, but they're false. All right, we'll close with it. Uh, get 1 Corinthians 1 and we'll, we'll close this thing out so that uh, Milani can go out and preach the gospel like she said Christians should do. <laughs> Very good answer, Milani. Uh, let's go, to, uh, go to 1 Corinthians... Uh, no. 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. What did I say? I don't know what I said. 1 Corinthians 1. Okay. How are you going to spot a new apostolic reformation church? First, when you read their website, and it has the biblical government of apostles and prophets, followed by pastors, teachers, evangelists, it's NAR. You can mark it down. It's new apostolic reformation. When you see that as that form of government, and there's five of them they put, now, the guys that are going to go covert because they know that there's preachers like me that preach this stuff and are against them, what they'll do is they'll hide it. These are the covert guys. They'll say, well, we'll have a five-fold ministry of leadership. That five-fold is pastors, teachers, evangelists, but the powers and the prophets and the apostles. So that's the covert way they do it. Um, number two, you must. You must absolutely look at who their guest preachers are. And you must find out what ministry they were sent out of or what church they came out of. you got to start making these connections. How many of you heard of the false prophet Rod Parsley? Rod Parsley has been around for years, years. He hosts the Dominion Camp Meeting. He's a Dominion guy, which is a big part of New Apostolic Reformation. He's a NAR guy. He's a New Apostolic Reformation preacher. He runs the World Harvest Church. It's in, big in Ohio, now in Indiana. Where are you all from? That's Rod Parsley. He's a wicked New Apostolic false teacher. We got a church right in town that's preaching that stuff, right out of that ministry. Right out of that ministry. It was right down the road from us when we were on Jerry Witts and the bend. It's new apostolic stuff. It's, fa it's 100% false. You know how much money they got? Remember we were talking about the money? They're taking dominion. I'm not making this stuff up, folks. I'm not trying to be Mr. You're against everybody. I just am against everything that's false. And when it's, when it's a dominating force... We can't walk around with our heads in the sand like nothing's going on here. People are being deceived by this. And they're being drawn in on all this emotional stuff. You look up Rod Parsley, you'll be glad I told you so you can stay away from him. Um, that's 10 minutes down the road. You can go 45 minutes down the road um, and, and Greg Locke's running a huge huge ministry. That's a new apostolic reformation guy. That's a deliverance guy. He's been rebuked so many times by independent Baptist preachers. I'm talking good ones. He used to be a Baptist preacher. He knows the truth. He knows the truth. So he either is just absolutely never was saved or he got mixed up with such the wrong crowd that he's so confused now. He's a sensationalist. He has a big crowd. He's got money coming in. It's deliverance stuff. It's, I'm telling you, it's wicked. It's wicked. So you've got to look at their guest preachers and you've got to look at their sending church. And the last thing I'll say, and then we'll read 1 Corinthians 1. If they use any curriculum or any music out of Bethel Church, it's NAR. It's new apostolic stuff. They'll have healing rooms where people go to be set free and launched into their destiny. And now we can have healing crystals. It's new apostolic stuff. I never heard of that. Well, I want you to know about it because we don't believe in modern day faith healers and apostles. Because if they were real, we wouldn't need nursing home ministries. We go to the nursing home to preach the gospel. 
we're not going down there to lay hands on Aunt Susie to cure her of cancer or whatever debilitating. We can't do that. But we can get them healed spiritually. Spiritual deliverance, not physical deliverance. I believe God can work miracles but not through me doing an instantaneous sign miracle where I instantaneously lay my hands on you. You're healed! Or declare COVID gone. Right. I mean, I can make a, I, I, I can make a lot of money at that. Oh, yeah. We can rake in some big bucks. It's of the devil. And I don't know why anybody would get excited about serving the devil. I'm more excited about serving the true Jesus. Amen. 1 Corinthians 1. Here's what we got. And then we'll close it out. And I'll trust that it was educational and somewhat humorous at times. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but, un, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. I've got power. You've got power in the gospel, man. We've got the most powerful message. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the dispute of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Here it is. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. We're on the right team at the right time, with the right message. The gospel is where the real power is. Don't ever, ever let anybody talk you out of the power of the gospel.